Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about human rights and government policy. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so today we're going to have the uh, World Health Organization uh, press conference, and um, along, along the way, um, Dr. Tedros is going to talk about the World Food Program um, that just recently won a Nobel Prize. That's a big thing for 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 anyone uh, to to win that particular prize. So Nobel Peace Prize for the World Food program um he's also going to talk about uh china and uh the republic of of korea um join cofax and they have uh, a lot to to bring to the table with um trying to help cofax reach all parts of the world in solidarity with uh, vaccines and distribution distribution of those vaccines um, to all parts of the world regardless of their ability to pay the costs for them. Um, as it was said um, by uh, Justin Trudeau when Canada became a member of COVAX that we need to focus on eliminating the virus wherever it is um, and that is probably very true, and all the nations that are part of COVAX uh, agree with that. Um, also, he's going to talk about uh, millions of children um, that are missing out on uh, life-saving vaccines, and part of the reason for bringing COVAX around is to help vaccinate uh, children, and uh, of course, um, vaccinating everyone that that um, against uh, COVID-19, bringing that vaccine forward and treatments uh, for uh, for COVID-19. So let's uh, hear what Dr. Tedros and the rest of WHO have to say. Um, up next here. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Fadila Shai speaking to you from the Geneva Geneva WHO headquarters and welcoming you to our global COVID-19 press conference today, Friday 9 October. Uh, we have in the executive board meeting room Dr. Tedros, the WHO Director General. Joining us, uh, joining him is Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, Health Emergencies, uh, Dr. Maria von Kerkhoff, Technical Lead for COVID-19, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, a Chief Scientist, Dr. Bruce Elward, Senior Advisor to the Director General, who leads also the ACT Accelerator, Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director, Department of Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals, and uh, online, Dr. Maria Angela Simao, Assistant Director General, Access to Medicine and Health uh, Products. Welcome all. This press conference is being translated. We have some issues. Yeah. This press conference is being translated into the six UN official languages plus um, Portuguese and Hindi. Now, um, without further delay, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Shukran Jazilan Fadila. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the World Food Program on being awarded the Nobel 
Peace Prize today. Every day, WFP does incredible work in many countries. We're delighted for our friends and colleagues at WFP and for the entire UN family. Congratulations to WFP and the whole UN family. Vaccines are one of the most powerful inventions in human history. The smallpox has been eradicated and polio is on the brink thanks to vaccines. Once fear diseases like diphtheria, tetanus, measles, meningitis, and cervical cancer can all be prevented thanks to vaccines. We now have effective vaccines for Ebola and the world's first malaria vaccine is now being piloted in three African countries. And as you know, the world is eagerly anticipating the results of trials of vaccines against COVID-19, which are needed for WHO authorization. Once we have an effective vaccine, we must also use it effectively. And the best way to do that is by making sure it's available to all countries equitably through the COVAX facility. COVAX is an unprecedented partnership between WHO, Gavi, manufacturers, and CEPI, and has the largest portfolio of potential COVID-19 vaccines, with several in advanced human trials. This week, China, the Republic of Korea, and Nauru joined the COVAX facility bringing the total number of countries and economies that are part of the global initiative for vaccine access to 171. And we're discussing with the rest of the countries. Initially, supply of vaccines will be limited, but by sharing supply equitably, countries and economies that are part of COVAX can distribute vaccines simultaneously to priority populations, including health workers, older people, and those with underlying conditions. The aim of COVAX is to ensure that 2 billion doses are manufactured and distributed equitably by the end of 2021. We also welcome the announcement by one vaccine developer, Moderna, that it will not enforce its patent rights over its COVID-19 vaccine during the pandemic. And this is in line with what we have launched with Costa Rica in CITAP. We look forward to learning more about what this announcement means in terms of technology transfer, though. We appreciate this act of solidarity, which is in line with the principles of the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, or CTAP, as I said earlier. Sharing the benefits of innovation is the best way to end the pandemic and accelerate the global economic recovery. The advice WHO gives to the world on vaccines is guided by the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, or SAGE. SAGE met earlier this week to review the latest development for vaccines and vaccination against polio, measles, rotavirus, pneumococcus, and COVID-19. SAGE has recommended that any decisions about the allocation and prioritization of COVID-19 vaccines should be grounded in ethical values, including equal respect, global equity, national equity, and reciprocity, as outlined in the WHO SAGE Values Framework published last month. And second, SAGE issued a prioritization roadmap which is designed to help countries make decisions about WHO, should be, about who should be prioritized to receive the initially limited supply of vaccines for COVID-19. SAGE also reviewed evidence from around the world on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on immunization activities. All regions have reported disruptions to immunization activities for many reasons, 
including constraints in supply and demand, reassignment of health workers, travel restrictions, and low availability of personal protective equipment. We are pleased to see that some countries have resumed immunization services, returning to or even exceeding the levels of vaccination prior to the pandemic. But many other countries are still recovering gradually, and there are still gaps to close. Millions of children globally are missing out on life-saving vaccines, rapidly restoring immunization clinics, campaigns, and outreach activities is the only way to prevent predictable outbreaks and deaths from diseases like measles and polio. SAGE has issued new recommendations that all countries urgently prioritize implementation of catch-up vaccination campaigns. Even as we work together to end the pandemic, we must remember that there are many other diseases and conditions that strike people down every day, which have been exacerbated by COVID-19. That includes stillbirth. Almost 2 million babies are stillborn every year, or one every 16 seconds, according to the first estimates of stillbirths published yesterday by UNICEF, the World Bank, WHO and the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. The report shows that 84% of stillbirths are in lower income countries, often due to poor quality of care during pregnancy and birth. Most stillbirths are preventable, but the pandemic could make this tragic situation even worse. Disruptions to services for maternal care could lead to even more stillbirths and even more heartbreak. The COVID-19 pandemic has also taken a heavy toll on the mental health of millions of people and highlighted the urgency of increasing investment in this neglected area of health. Tomorrow is World Mental Health Day. Close to 1 billion people are living with a mental disorder, and one person dies every 40 seconds by suicide. Yet, relatively few people globally have access to quality mental health services. In low- and middle-income countries, more than 75% of people with mental, neurological, and substance use disorders receive no treatment for their condition at all. It's time for this to change. It's time to increase investment in mental health services on a massive scale so that access to quality mental health services becomes a reality for everyone. Tomorrow, WHO will host the big event for mental health, an online global advocacy event that will bring together international and national leaders, advocates, sports people, and artists, including the K-pop group Super M from the Republic of Korea and Corede Bello from Nigeria. During this unique event, you will see and hear through stories of people living with mental health conditions, the challenges they face due to the ongoing pandemic and how they're dealing with them. I hope you will be inspired by the many examples of successful programs on adolescent mental health, suicide prevention, dementia, and many more that are being implemented by WHO in collaboration with our partners. You can watch the big event on WHO's website and through our social media channels, including Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitch. The big event is part of a large campaign to focus attention on mental health with many partners. I welcome the announcement earlier this week of the Healing Arts Auction hosted by the Auction House Christie's, the WHO Foundation, and UN75. This is a year-long auction that will raise money for the WHO Foundation, 
that will be used to support the mental health response to COVID-19 through the arts and beyond. Together, let's move for mental health. No health without mental health. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, uh, we had uh, some problem with the sound quality earlier. Uh, I apologize for that. It seems it's now being fixed. So thank you for your, your uh, patience. Now, I would like to uh, open the floor to a journalist to question from the media. I remind you that you will need to raise your hand, use the raise your hand icon in order to get in the queue to ask your questions. Um, let's start with uh, Polina Alcazar from Oncadena. Polina, can you hear me? Polina, can you hear me? Hola, si me escuchan, buenos días. Yeah, uh, yeah, good afternoon. We can hear you very well. Go ahead, please, uh, Polina. Muchas gracias por recibir mi pregunta. Paulina Alcázar desde Cancún, de Encadena News. Hace una semana recibimos los primeros dos vuelos desde Europa, de los directos que venían uno de Frankfurt y otro de París, donde fueron el punto de reunión de al menos 37 países europeos. Aun cuando Cancún se preparó con 7000 empresas certificadas en seguridad. Polina, en, en, en seguridad. Sí. Polina, uh, can you give us? ¿Me escuchas? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you, but uh, we still have some sound quality uh, problems. Can you just repeat okay. your question slowly uh, for uh, the translators to be able to translate to us your question? Thank you, Polina. Okay. Go ahead. Gracias. Gracias. Les saludo desde Cancún. Gracias por recibir nuestra pregunta. Hace una semana recibimos los primeros dos vuelos directos de Frankfurt y otro de París, donde fueron el punto de reunión de al menos 37 países europeos. Aun cuando Cancún se preparó con 7.000 empresas certificadas en seguridad e higiene, el paso del huracán Delta ocasionó que la mayoría de los hoteles tuvieran que evacuar al turismo. Al estar en refugios, ¿qué recomendaciones al turismo al regreso a casa? Gracias. Hi. Yes, uh... I think I got the, the core of your question, and, and this is something uh, that many countries have faced. Uh, this has certainly been faced in India, <clears throat> Bangladesh, certainly around the Caribbean area with the, the unprecedented number of uh, storms and um, uh, hurricanes uh, that we've had this year. <clears throat> uh, so dealing with two disasters effectively at one time is never easy because what you're obviously trying to do in a natural disaster is get people away from the point of the disaster, which often means concentrating those people in a place where you can provide them with safety, with shelter, uh, with medical care, uh, with food uh, and clean water. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's quite a task to be able to manage both risks at the same time. But it is possible to do so, and it has been shown <clears throat> in all of the countries I mentioned, that, that uh, a lot of work can be done both to provide that shelter and provide that support, but doing that in a way that acknowledges the risks of COVID-19 transmission um, and, in, in effect, uh, being able to uh, create enough distance uh, between people, uh, uh, increased use of masks, hand sanitization, good ventilation, and all of the other things. But it means obviously doing it in a more planned and intensive way and really trying to plan for those individuals for how long they're going to need that form of shelter um, and how you're going to 
manage those risks uh, during that time. There is no zero risk in this, and authorities and obviously affected communities have to balance the risk of COVID-19 against the real risk of injury uh, and uh, uh, from uh, the consequences of, uh, of, of a natural disaster. Uh, and certainly uh, the, the Americas ha has seen that through the, the wildfires in the United States, the hurricanes in the Caribbean, and, and, and many other uh, disasters that have occurred. We've seen the same in Sudan with the floods, um, and as I said, in, in with the monsoon and, and rains-related uh, flooding and, and typhoons uh, in, the, in, in Asia. So it is a very important part. We have issued guidance on, on how to deal with the humanitarian consequences of COVID-19 and how to de-risk those situations. And we will continue to offer direct support. Uh, certainly in the Americas, uh, the Pan American Health Organization, our regional office for the Americas, is very experienced at dealing with disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management. And I'm sure our office there is working closely with all countries and will provide any extra assistance and support and technical advice that uh, Mexico and other countries would need at this time. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Um, the next question is uh, for Emma Farge, Reuters. Emma, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, yes. I was wondering, um, as cases rise and restrictions come back um, or increase in many places, what can the WHO tell us about what it has observed about the broader impact of lockdowns or semi-lockdowns on people's health. And I'm thinking about the sedentary lifestyle, the diet, um, tobacco use that, that comes with many people's interpretation of uh, staying inside. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Uh, von Kerkhoff to take this question. Uh, thank you, Emma. Um, yes, indeed, um, we've certainly seen uh, an impact on people's lives um, all over the world based on the pandemic, um, and notably people who have been asked to stay home um, as part of the measures um, to, to control transmission. Um, in many situations, we're finding that individuals are trying to find ways to remain active um, whether if they can leave their home to go for a walk and if they're not able to leave home to be able to do some exercises uh, within their household. Of course, that's challenging um, in different types of situations. Um, but we are encouraging individuals all over to remain active as much as they can, um, even if they have to remain in their home to eat a healthy diet, um, yeah. to remain um, engaged socially uh, with their loved ones um, through different technologies. Uh, we've also seen people you know, out on their balconies and, and uh, uh, exchanging pleasantries and singing and um, with their loved ones. But certainly there has been an impact of, of these lockdown, so-called lockdown measures um, in many parts of the world. Um, what we are learning from many countries is as societies open up, um, we are learning that people are becoming more and more active in their daily lives and finding ways to resume normal activities through work, through school, um, through engagement um, with others. Um, but what countries are teaching us all over the world is that um, many of the measures that are put in place, the physical distancing, the hand hygiene, the respiratory etiquette, um, avoiding the three C's, you know, still need to remain in place um, while people get back to their, to their daily lives. And we're learning how to do that. Um, and I think every day is another opportunity for us to learn even more. But it is really critical um, if you are in a situation where you're asked to stay home, that you find different ways to keep your body active, to eat a healthy diet, to keep your brain engaged um, with others, find a book that you enjoy, listen to music, um, reach out to your loved ones. Because this has not only had a, 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 an impact on people's um, physical health, it's also had an impact on people's mental health. Just maybe follow up and just um, maybe in, in, in the, the way in which you pose the question, because I think it's important. Uh, you said as cases come back and restrictions come back, the, these are not uh, absolutely equivalent. Uh, there are many countries in which cases have come back uh, and through um, a mixture of uh, intensified surveillance and, in, and increased community empowerment and participation that can be kept under control. What we want to try and avoid, and sometimes it's unavoidable, we accept that. But what we want to try and avoid are these massive lockdowns that are so punishing to communities, to society, uh, and to everything else. So we, we, we don't want to, to flip 
from, you know, no cases, everyone, everything's open, a few cases, uh, everything shuts down again, because that's exactly the sort of scenario that we want to, to try uh, and avoid. What we really need to focus on is ensuring that as cases come back, and they will and do come back, and this virus is clearly showing that it's got a light, lot of life left in it, the vast majority of people in the world are still susceptible to the disease, and we need to make sure that we're also focusing not just on restrictive measures, but on the surveillance, on the testing, on the tracking, on community empowerment, on education, on everybody taking their responsibility, the community their responsibility, and the government their responsibility. Uh, and that we try, in as much as possible, to minimize the broader effects in society through uh, uh, large-scale, complete national shutdowns. Uh, this may be unavoidable, where the disease has got out of control uh, again, uh, but we shouldn't accept that the, the, in every country the return of cases should be seen with an immediate return of the need for, uh, for lockdown restrictions at a national level. There are many things that can be done bet uh, between those two points, and we should make every effort to do so in order to keep our social, economic uh, lives open, and particularly schools and other vital services. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ryan. The next question is from Tony Waterman from CGTN. Um, Tony, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you very much for taking my question. I just wanted to talk about China joining the COVAX facility. Um, I'm wondering what you think this, what sort of impact this could have when it comes to getting those two billion doses out by the end of next year? Does it speed up the timetable, you think, at all? What will be the impact of China uh, joining? And also whether or not you know what sort of commitment China is making when it comes to uh, the money, the vaccines, both, and, and how much? Thank you, Tony. Um, Dr. Edward will uh, take this question. Thank you very much. Um, the, as the Director General has laid out m multiple times, the more countries that participate in the COVAX facility, the greater the opportunity of being able to roll out vaccines as rapidly as possibly, as fairly as possibly, to reduce the risk of, uh, of uh, severe COVID disease globally. Um, so the more countries that join the COVAX facility, the more economies that are part of that, uh, the better. So in terms of the time Timelines. The uh, w once again, um, the more countries that join, the better. It's it, it's quite uh, quite simply uh, as simple as that. Um, there was a second question, I think, in terms of uh, some of the details that's still being worked out, as we understand, and we anticipate by the beginning of next week that there will be specifics on uh, on volumes uh, and and the like. Thank you, uh, Dr. Elward. I would like now to invite um, Kamran from Azerbaijan Real Television for the next question. Kamran, welcome. Uh, we, Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, do you hear me? Very well. You know, uh, hello from Azerbaijan, from Real TV. Thank you, Ms. Fadila. And you know about the situation in Azerbaijan, we are in the war situation which uh, we were fighting for our lands, which occupied by the Armenia 30 uh, years ago. At this time, we have information about that uh, ambulance, uh, ambulance uh, cars uh, opened fire by Armenians, and four doctors died. The doctors sacrificed their lives during coronavirus pandemic, and at this time, uh, I, I want uh, to say about that to vote his organization. We know uh, we uh, there have social isolation. There have many rules from WHO at this at this time. But uh, of course, uh, the Armenian uh, fight open fire to our doctors, to our uh, doctors, to our ambulance cars. Okay, I know it's not, it's not included to your authority, but I want to know your reaction, please. Cameron, uh, what is the question, please? What we can do for our soldiers during the coronavirus to save them from coronavirus? They are fighting for the um, 
uh, our lands. What we are the we can do them for save their uh, uh, save them from coronavirus. Okay, from coronavirus. Thank you, Cameron. And the, and the, yeah, uh, Dr. Ryan, um, if you want to take this question, please. Yes. Well, uh, first of all, uh, let me sympathise with with. <coughs> The wrong one came on, sorry. Uh, first of all, our, our hearts go out to, to all of those uh, civilians who are suffering in, in that conflict which um, has taken off again uh, and our country, our regional office for Europe and our country offices in the area are working very closely with governments on all sides to establish the, the impact on civilian populations. Uh, first and foremost, I would say that whatever the conflict is between countries, civilians need to be protected and that is the responsibility under uh, the rules of war for all participating parties. Second, the health workers within that are a special group and should never be attacked by any side. I'm not aware of the specific report you refer to, but WHO um, uh, wishes to just to restate that all parties uh, engaged in conflict must respect uh, the lives, uh, and not only respect the lives of health workers, but facilitate and support the work that they do. Um, COVID-19, uh, as we know, uh, respects uh, no uniform <laughs> nor no office. So from that perspective, everyone is susceptible to infection. Um, uh, soldiers are no exception to that. What soldiers do have is a younger age profile. They're fit and healthy young men. Uh, and it is a terrible tragedy that such young men are sent to war. Uh, but uh, COVID in itself represents a small threat in their lives, uh, but a significant one that needs to be managed. Uh, certainly in the 1918-19 pandemic, the concentration of young soldiers and young conscripts in large army camps was a major factor in amplifying the disease and spreading that disease and moving it around the world, in fact. Um, the uh, lack of information on that from within military systems was one of the reasons that the world was very unaware of the spreading pandemic because the requirements to manage military intelligence uh, superseded the need to tell people. So it's really important that uh, soldiers have the opportunity to get the information to protect themselves, that they are billeted in places that maintain proper social distance and hygiene, um, and obviously will get the opportunity in due course to uh, access vaccination when there's a safe and effective vaccine available. But again, just let me restate from WHO's perspective that the involvement of or attacking of civilians in any conflict is wrong uh, and contravenes the laws of war. Equally, attacking health workers represents the same abomination. Just I would like to add a bit. Um, just two things, and I fully agree with what Mike said. Uh, first of all, uh, we would like to call all uh, parties in the conflict uh, for a ceasefire. This is a pandemic which is affecting the whole world. So I hope they would agree to a ceasefire. And second, any differences could be resolved amicably. And we hope this conflict also will be resolved amicably without loss of life from any of the, the parties. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Dr. Tedros, I would like now uh, to invite Antonio Brotto from EFE, the Spanish News Agen Agency, for the next question. Antonio, can you hear me? Antonio, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, uh, sorry, Fadela. Uh, good no problem. Uh, I am going to uh, to make the question in, in Spanish. You are welcome. Uh, okay. Sí, el doctor Ryan uh, ha dicho antes que espera que el aumento de casos no lleve a, a nuevos confinamientos en, en zonas como Europa, pero en España eh, ya es el caso. Desde hoy en, en Madrid se ha declarado el estado de alarma, con lo cual la situación en la capital española ya es bastante similar a la de eh, los meses de marzo y abril. Eh, además, es, es eh, una situación que ha, que ha producido un 
debate político entre, entre la, el gobierno nacional y el gobierno local. Eh, quería saber eh, la valoración de, de la OMS acerca de esta declaración de, de estado de alarma y, y, y si han apoyado, han asesorado a, al gobierno de España a la hora de tomar esta decisión. ¿Creen que es la decisión correcta? Muchas gracias. Thank you, Antonio. Dr. Ryan. Yeah, uh, that's a lot of questions, Antonio. Uh, uh, um, I, I would first of all say that it is the, the, the sovereign right of the government of Spain and the people of Spain to determine their, their path through this pandemic, and WHO does not try to influence uh, decisions made by national governments on behalf of their citizens. We offer advice when we're asked. Uh, to offer advice regarding uh, any potential course of action that a, a country may take. Uh, secondly, oh, just to clarify, I didn't, uh, I didn't state that lockdowns were not necessary. I said that lockdowns were not the absolute and only consequence of new cases, that there were many situations in which numbers of new cases can be contained in the ways that we have been speaking about and the ways many countries have demonstrated since the very beginning of this epidemic. If you catch this disease in the early, early stages and, and even not so early sometimes as many countries like South Korea and Japan have seen, uh, and you work hard on surveillance and cluster investigation and isolating cases, and quarantining contacts and ensuring that we can break chains of transmission, even though a lot of, uh, many of the cases can be asymptomatic and sometimes it's hard to find them, but by focusing in on these symptomatic cases, by focusing in on shutting down those trains of, chains of transmission, you catch up. That's the problem. You start behind. And then like in any race, the further you start behind, the harder it is to catch up. The closer you are to the finish line or the starting line when the race starts, the more chances you have to catch up. And then when you catch up, uh, you can speed up. Uh, and the problem in many countries is they're getting caught behind the line uh, and then they're not accelerating quickly enough. And then they're getting themselves into situations where the disease is, is, is very, very established and very, very intense. And then there are no options. But To, to shut down and lock down in many situations, particularly at a municipality or a city level, because it becomes very, very hard to stop the virus unless you separate people from other people. Uh, and that is a very difficult thing for everyone to accept. Uh, if we go back to the, the experience of many countries in, 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 in Western Pacific and, and, and Southeast Asia, a lot of their struggle was actually trying to stop transmission even in house households. It wasn't just at mass gatherings. There was a lot of transmission going on within houses. And that ability to uh, isolate individual cases uh, was difficult because people live in multi-generational households and many people living together. Governments need to support the process of isolation of cases and quarantine of contacts. And it's a massive investment. Governments need to support really, really detailed surveillance, proper testing, fast turnaround of tests, uh, contact tracing and these things. And this takes a massive effort. Um, and there are many, many countries uh, right now who are not so far along that implementing those kinds of measures will have an impact on this epidemic curve and may avoid the worst aspects of major, major lockdowns. Um, in the case of uh, Spain uh, and particularly in the case of places like Madrid, clearly the transmission there is very intense. And clearly both the government at local and at national level are concerned. Uh, I believe they differ in the scale and type of response. It is not for me to, to I don't see that data at that level, Uh, but I would ask, uh, or we would as WHO ask, uh, that one of the biggest problems in this response has been when governments differ, people die. So let us make sure that we come together and make good decisions. Uh, and sometimes compromise is the best way forward, uh, and uh, everyone should remain reasonable in this. It is very difficult to translate science into action. And uh, the same data presented to two different people may result in two different pieces of advice. So it is tough for governments to pull that together into a single policy that everybody agrees with. But that is the role of government, and that, is, that unfortunately is the, that comes with the job. Uh, and uh, we would support uh, governments, especially governments in federated states, that the provincial or state level work very closely in consultation with, with national governments, and importantly, the national governments 
consult with the sub-national level, because it goes both ways. And we've seen examples of both. We've seen examples where uh, local governments have acted uh, without consulting national governments, and we've seen the exact opposite. We've seen situations where national governments have not consulted uh, and involved enough local government in their decision-making processes. Yeah, may just would like to add a few few words to what Mike said. Um, uh, we we have said it before. We have worked with um, Spain very closely, uh, and we respect uh, the leadership. And we also believe that without good reason and without you know the uh, local condition, I don't think the government decided the measures that. Uh, it decided to 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 to, to take, uh, and we're very confident. And the second is cooperation of the community is very very important because this is everybody's responsibility. And then the third part uh, is uh, the good side. Uh, in when uh, the uh, COVID pandemic was at its climax in the week of March 34, for instance, in, in Spain, the number of cases was high and the number of deaths was also high. But what we see now is very different. The number of cases is high, but the number of deaths is, deaths is, is, is low. Uh, and that's a very important uh, progress, and we hope, um, uh, you know, the focus on uh, keeping the number of deaths low will, will, will continue, and we also hope that these measures will uh, bring uh, better uh, outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ryan. Dr. Tedros, I would like now um, to invite Helen Branswell from Stat to ask the next question. Helen, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Thank you very much. Um, this is Probably a question for Maria. I'm wondering what WHO um, thinks now about duration of immunity post-infection um, and whether or not in cases where people uh, appear to be having a second infection, is, is the second infection as severe, more severe, less severe? Thank you. Hi, Helen. Thank you for the question. So um, this is a question we, we discuss with our international networks every day, um, looking at immunity, uh, the body's response to infection. Um, there are many studies that are underway that are, that are measuring this, that are demonstrating this. Um, what we understand is that individuals who are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus develop an immune response. Um, people that have mild disease, have moderate disease, all the way through severe disease, uh, develop this immune response. Even people who have had asymptomatic infection, that is, no uh, symptoms at all, also develop an immune response. What we're trying to get a better handle on is how strong this immune response is as it relates to the different types of antibodies that develop, um, and also looking at T-cell responses as well, which is different to neutralizing antibodies, for example, and for how long this antibody response lasts. Um, our gold standard of a test is called a longitudinal study, which follows the same individuals over time, uh, taking repeat samples from the same individuals to, to look at that antibody level. And ideally, we would want to be looking at neutralizing antibodies and also a T-cell response over time. There are very few of these that are currently underway. Um, however, uh, we are uh, discussing with the researchers that are carrying these out right now, um, and this, the, the results are not, um, they're not finished uh, because these studies are ongoing. Ten months into a pandemic, uh, we need to follow individuals for longer periods of time. And in some studies, we see this antibody response stay strong over several months, three, four months, five months that they're, that they're following. And in some studies, there is a slight decline. So I don't have a complete answer to that yet. In the situation of um, reinfection, there are case reports of reinfection that we are aware of from, from a number of countries. Um, and in these instances, the reinfection has been demonstrated by sequencing. So there was a sequence that was collected during the first infection, and then there was a sequence that was collected in the second infection. We have a specific working group specifically on reinfection. 
because we have a lot of questions. Right now, these are case reports um, from, from a handful of countries. Uh, we don't have estimates at a, at a population level, um, but there are some that have been reported. And what we want to understand is what was the immune response, the antibody response after the first infection, and what was the antibody response at, that, at the time of the second infection? Did those antibodies indeed wane or decline, as we call it, um, you know, what, what is happening in these instances. Um, so we, we, we don't know yet. We're learning about this. Um, the other question that you have about is a second infection, will it be more, uh, will it be more disease or less disease? Um, again, we only have a handful of examples. Um, and in some examples, um, the second infection uh, resulted in less disease or more mild infection. And I have seen some where the second infection was more uh, diseased. So again, I don't have a complete answer to that. But what is important, I think, and everybody needs to, to understand, is that after 35, 36 million cases globally, um, and from all of the research that we have seen, we see individuals time and time again in all of the studies that we have seen develop a strong immune response. Um, we don't know how long that lasts, so I don't have that answer yet. We have some clues from other coronaviruses, from the common cold coronaviruses, but also from SARS-CoV-1 and MERS coronavirus. Um, and those tell us that, that we don't have a lifelong immunity to one infection. So it is possible that antibodies will wane over time, but we need those studies to be conducted. So it is important that everybody continues to do it all, as the Director General continues to say, with our physical distancing, our respiratory etiquette, our avoiding the three Cs, all of the measures that are put in place that will keep all of us safe, keeping ourselves uh, from getting infected and also from passing it to someone else. Um, no, seeing we have... Uh we have uh, Helen on board. Uh, Helen, I'm sure you, as you report on this, uh, you're fa f tracking this very closely, but certainly we're making progress in Congo collectively with all our partners in the government. And uh, we've only had uh, two confirmed cases reported in the last 21 days. We currently have gone from overall in this epidemic with 42 health areas and 13 health zones, now down to three health areas and three health zones. Um, and uh, uh, Bikoro, which was a very big hotspot in this epidemic, has now not had a case for 21 days. We have the three health areas still affected are Makanza, Latumbe, and Bolomba. Um, uh, again, uh, with over 35,000 uh, people uh, vaccinated and with very intense surveillance on the ground and lots of community engagement, we're still not out of the woods uh, there yet. Um, and again, uh, all agencies responding are struggling to get the necessary funds to continue these activities. And um, uh, uh, we are working with the surrounding countries as well on preparedness issues. So I think uh, on a day when we see intensification of the COVID uh, yeah, uh, 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 outbreak, it is great to see progress being made on Ebola uh, in Congo. And again, the use of a novel vaccine taken to the field at minus 80 degrees, the use of novel, novel therapeutics, including monoclonal antibodies, demonstrating what a difference these innovations can make in the long term if properly developed and tested. And I think uh, with COVID moving along those same pathways, certainly Ebola represents a pathfinder um, uh, on research and development and, and roll out of some of these solutions over the, the last number of years. But as I said, we're not out of the woods yet. We need to maintain very great vigilance on this response. But again, testament to the NGOs, <clears throat> to the government, to the UN partners on the ground who continue to fight Ebola while the world's attention is very focused appropriately on COVID-19. Thank you. I would like now to give the floor to Jamie Keaton from Associated Press. Jamie, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Penelope. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, please. Great. Thank you so much for taking my call, uh, my, my, my question. Um, this is from Mike. Um, Mike, the epidemic is doubling every few weeks in the UK. France is running out of ICU beds. Spain has just overridden the local Madrid authorities, you mentioned the disconnect between local and national authorities to impose a lockdown. People clearly don't respect the measures and believe authorities. So what, the, the world looks to the WHO for guidance. What should governments be doing exactly, if not lockdowns? And if I could sneak in a second question very quickly, because it's been a long time. Have any of you accepted President Putin's 
offer to take the Russian vaccine, or do you plan to? Thank you. Whoa. Oh, Jimmy, I think you got a whoa there from somebody. Uh, um, I could we could stay here now for the, for the next ten minutes, uh, Jamie, and, and tell you what government should do because we've been saying it since uh, January the 30th and before. Um, because there there are no new answers on that, right? We know what we need to do, and we know that it is a combination of all of those things, and not one of those things by itself addresses all of the issues that we face in this pandemic. Um, and in that sense. Uh, I know it's ne not necessarily what uh, people want to hear, but that, that is it. We have the tools we have. We have seen how effective those tools can be if applied uh, in the right proportions, at the right time, and in the right way uh, at country level. It is, though, sad to see uh, many countries in Europe experiencing a, a, a rapid rise in cases, and governments do have to take decisive action in order to try and shut down uh, transmission. And it is a very, very difficult when transmission reaches a certain level to, uh, to not put in place restrictions that – and it's not about putting in lockdowns. What governments are trying to do is not lockdown. What governments are trying to do is break chains of transmission. They're trying to stop the disease jumping from person to person. And there are certain circumstances in which trying to do that becomes exceptionally difficult when there is intense community transmission. And what we've said since the beginning of this pandemic is we need to avoid situations in which the disease can run rampant at community level. We need to keep the disease down to the lowest possible level, sporadic cases, clusters of cases. We need to jump on clusters. We need to try and prevent the disease um, becoming a rampant epidemic at country level and spilling into older populations and vulnerable populations and causing uh, high numbers of death. We need to protect uh, those populations. And I would say in situations, for example, now in Europe, as the disease is spreading uh, fairly intensely in many, many countries, one very important uh, uh, aspect of the response now beyond the attempt to shut down transmission is to ensure that we protect the most vulnerable, uh, the old, older populations and those people <clears throat> most likely to do very badly uh, clinically in, in this disease. Uh, again, we need to uh, empower communities. We need to tell people how to protect themselves um, by physical distance, by hygiene, wearing masks, avoiding crowded places, taking care with ventilation in places where they can't uh, uh, avoid being inside and everyone being their own risk manager. Uh, we need to have uh, very, very strong surveillance case detection, lab testing, quick turnaround, quick results, good uh, contact tracing, cluster investigation. We need to support people who isolate at home. We need to support uh, contacts to quarantine at home. And I mean support means real support to do that. Um, and uh, we need to um, be very, very careful with any forms of mass gathering that bring people together at close quarters. Um, we need uh, to shore up our health system uh, and ensure that the health systems right now can cope with the increasing number of very sick patients. And we need to protect those most vulnerable from exposure. And we need to work real hard, and I mean really, really hard, to fund the effort to develop vaccines that will hopefully take us a long way along the way to coming to uh, uh, a, a way of living with this virus and bringing it finally under effective control. Um, lots of things to do, Jamie, um, uh, and uh, none, of them are, none, of them are, uh, none of them are easy. Yeah, just very briefly to say we're not in the same situation that we were in five, six months ago. We know so much more now than we did in the beginning of this pandemic, than we did a month ago, than we did two months ago. And all of the measures that Mike has just outlined, that we have been saying for months, that governments have been doing for months, work. It's the implementation that is the challenge. But what countries are doing and what they're learning from is from their own experience and from how, that they, how they have applied the tools, how they are now applying the tools using the data that they are capturing through their surveillance systems, through their testing systems, through their hospital-based systems, through the research that they are conducting to apply to the most local level. And as Mike has said, this is hard, and this will continue to be hard as we are trying to find this balance of opening our societies back up 
getting schools open again because we recognize how important this is, getting essential medical services back online, making sure that people who need vaccines are getting vaccines, making sure that babies are born safely, making sure that people receive cancer treatments. All of that needs to continue to happen while we still work on suppressing transmission. And that balance that we are working towards, that countries are working towards, is applying what is learned. So I think we need to recognize um, that we will continue to, to gain knowledge about this virus, how we can apply the tools that we have, because we have so many tools right now that reduce transmission, that break chains of transmission, that save lives because of earlier actions around surveillance and detecting cases, getting those results back quicker, getting people into clinical care quicker, having making sure that they receive oxygen if they need it, dexamethasone if they have are in severe and critical condition, uh, ventilation uh, support, all of this saves lives. And if you notice, the, the case numbers may be increasing in many countries, but as the Director General has said, the mortality has reduced. And that is because we know so much more. Our clinicians, our nurses, our medical professionals have direct experience with this virus, are better trained, are better experienced, and are providing that life-saving care. But we are also working towards, as you've heard us say many, many times, is not only informing the public, but engaging the public, empowering the public, and enabling them to take the actions that they need. Every individual, all communities need to, to be supported in taking these decisions. As Mike has just said, if, if there is a stay-at-home order that is in place, they need to be supported in being able to do so, making sure that they can feed their families, making sure they don't lose their jobs. So this is very challenging, and I think as we move through this calibration period of trying to figure out how to apply these at the local level, we need to be supportive of governments, we need to be supportive of communities, and we need to be supportive of individuals, because we are absolutely all in this together, and these viruses do not respect borders, they don't respect uh, any any of this, so we are in this together whether we like it or not. Um, and so let's focus on the positive ways in which we can support each other in getting through these very difficult times. Sumi, so there was a second question from Jamie on the vaccine and Russia vaccines. Uh, just like to say that WHO will apply the same criteria to all vaccines uh, and ultimately both in terms of uh, research and development in terms of any vaccine trials that come along and also in terms of vaccine policy. Kate O'Brien, is here can speak to that. I know SAGE have been working very, very hard on setting out the, the vaccine policy and strategy. Uh, but again, we are engaged with and we've had some excellent calls uh, with uh, colleagues in, in, in Russian institutions and, and, and have laid out to them as we have laid out to, to other researchers around the world what WHO's criteria and data needs are for the uh, for vaccine trials, for pre-qualification, for good manufacturing practice, and the data that will be needed by Sage in order to determine vaccine policy uh, down the line. So a lot going on with many countries to determine what the best products are, and again, many m much of that selection and much of that policy is generated by independent experts who operate and advise WHO. I don't know, Sumia or Kate, if you want to add anything to that. Um, thank you, Dr. Ryan. Um, we will uh, take maybe the last question from uh, Corinne Gretler, Bloomberg. Corinne, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, I just had a very quick question on um, whether you've gotten any steer from China um, on when, how far along we might be from them approving the scientific team for the second mission. Um, and also, when do you expect you could start that? Thank you, Corinne. Uh, this question is for Dr. Mike Ryan. Mike, please. I'm having a, Mike is having mic problems today. This, this, this mic has a life of its own. Um, Yes, no, we, we, we are making progress, but let me, me, let me, me clarify here. We, we, we provide lists of names to, to countries as a matter of generating scientific collaboration here, and we're really, really trying to connect the best uh, Chinese scientists with a, a collection, a selection of the best international scientists so we can make progress on this investigation. Uh, this is not uh, about uh, WHO or the Director General uh, seeking the permission of China for the, the list of names. We, 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 we share as a courtesy to have a dialogue around the best team. 
uh, not as a means of blocking or not blocking individuals or whatever. So it's really important at this point that we, 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 re we reflect on that. Uh, we are ready to move um, very, very quickly on this. Uh, we, we, can, we can put teams in the field in, in 24 hours in most epidemic responses. So the issue is not logistics. Uh, the issue is getting that agreement um, around the final shape of that that team. We would like the team, and the Director General has made this clear and has been in, in, in discussions on this with senior Chinese counterparts, um, that, and the terms of reference allows for this, is that the teams can begin work virtually uh, and then deploy at the appropriate time. So we would like to see this international team establish a virtual relationship with their counterparts to review the, um, the, uh, the existing data, to review the phase one um, uh, progress made by Chinese colleagues and then to plan and implement phase two and then to deploy uh, to the field at the appropriate time. Uh, and, uh, and I think all of those things are possible uh, in, in the very near future and we look forward to, to concluding uh, that process with, with Chinese colleagues very soon. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Ryan. I think we, we uh, are uh, reaching uh, the end of this press conference. I would like to thank all my, the DG uh, for his presence and all my colleagues here. I would like just to remind journalists that you will be receiving the audio file and the DG opening remark as soon as this press conference is over. The full transcript will be available for you on the WHO website tomorrow. Um, thank you uh, for your uh, presence and your participation. And I do apologize, as usual, to journalists. I wasn't able to take their question. You know that you can reach us anytime through media inquiries at who.int. Thank you so much, and have a great weekend. Yeah, for dinner. Yes, sorry, uh, I would like to ask DG for his Might closing remarks. To, just before the DG closes, because he uh, gave his personal and our organizational congratulations to, to the World Food Program. Uh, just may I say also on behalf of the staff uh, of, uh, of WHO, but most especially those of us who work in uh, some of the most dangerous places in the world, uh, WFP not only feeds the hungry, but it moves most of the humanitarian force around into the most uh, extreme of environments. And we've worked very closely with WFP on life support and camps and tents and all of the things that are needed to keep teams in the deep field. So uh, WFP doesn't just uh, feed the hungry, <laughs> it feeds and protects us in the field as well and allows us to do our job on behalf of those who we serve. So we used to say this in, in West Africa on the route breaks and I'll say it to the world, uh, what we say within the staff of the UN system is uh, WFP rocks. So well done WFP. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ryan. I would like to give the floor to Dr. Tedros. Sorry, uh, DG, uh, you okay. have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. I agree with Mike with the rocks, huh? <laughs> WFP rocks. And also I would like to add UN rocks, so <laughs> proud to be UN. And then um, I just would like to uh, thank all who have joined today, uh, joined us today, uh, and I would like to remind again that tomorrow uh, WHO will host a big event on mental health. I said it, so I'm just uh, reminding. And please join us. And I would also like to appreciate um, K-pop group Super M from Korea, Kamsamida, and also uh, Korede Bello from Nigeria, who will be joining the big uh, event. You can watch the big event on WHO's website and all the other things I have listed earlier. And please join. Um, as I said earlier, no health without mental health. So see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Okay, so... We heard um, from Dr. Tedros and um, Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Kirkakoff um, speaking about uh, the latest happenings with COVID-19. Um, one of the other things that um, that the World Health Organization they they try to take care of all aspects of health around the world. This also includes um, mental health and. Uh, the 
um, World Health Organization is going to host a event uh, that will be uh, held around the world. It, of course, uh, downloadable from off of YouTube um, about the importance of mental health and how important it is to, to keep our minds healthy and to do the right things so that we can fight against um, what could be a killer disease called depression. So, um, thank you for listening today. You've been listening to Policy and Rights uh, here on Depictions Media, and my name is Michael. Please do, wherever you see that subscribe button, click on it and subscribe to us so that you can get continued updates about what is happening around us. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.